I think uh, a lot of us are intrigued to know something of your background, in particular, I think, the, the journey that brought you to the United States, those early days of Chibani. Can you tell us something about those early days? Yeah, pretty rough. I mean, um, before I go further, I want to thank you for that Pleasure. warm introduction, welcoming me, and, and, and be honored to be with everybody here. Um, you know, Sydney, I, I arrived to Sydney 2011, right, uh, Peter? And I never thought, you know, after 20 hours, you know, coming to this new place, uh, that you immediately warm up to some place like this fast. And I told the, uh, the team that time, I said, I said, I would like to buy this company so I can stay connected to this country. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did. Before I, I left, I bought the company before I left, and that was the first thing I bought. Um, and, and a quick, quick story about that, and I'm, I'm going to be very quick, it's very funny. Um, I, uh, I bought it, it was the first thing I ever bought in my life, like this size, right? Yeah. So um, and we have a very small his startup's history. We, we started with $700,000, um, $1 million in SBA loan, and you know, every week we would run out of the money. We didn't know what, what to do, so it was very small resources. So thinking that from 2007 to 2011, I was here, and I'm, I won't mention the numbers that I bought, but it's in millions that I bought this business, and I feel like I'm, I'm feeling good, right? So I just bought a really business. This is what companies do. This is what uh, CEOs do. So I just did that. I'm feeling good. I got on the uh, Qantas flight, flying first class, feeling good. Um, and at that time, I was getting my first German Shepherd dog. And this was my dream of mine to have my dog. My home is upstate, and, and I always grow up with dogs and shepherd dogs, and I'd like to have it. And I arrived home that evening at 7 o'clock, and the person who brought the dog to me, is, my dog's name is Panya, and she, he said, well, I just fed her. Uh, all you need to do is just make sure that she has enough water, and you just take, him, take her home. Uh, and I did. I brought her home, and I was bring in my luggages in and put the teapots on and just try to make some tea. And still feeling really good, like on top of the mountains. And I, I didn't see the dog. The dog was gone. And I, I said, what has happened to this dog? And, and this started to smell a little funny in the house. <laughs> and I went to look at the hallway and I saw, and excuse me, we were eating lunch, I don't want to mention that, but she pooped in two different places and, and peed in so many different places. <laughs> like this whole hallway is a mess. So I'm looking at the dog, I'm looking at this. I just bought a business. I feel like at the top of the mountain and there's nobody else in the house and the house is smelling. <laughs> and within 15 minutes, I realized that I need to clean this. <laughs> and, and I found myself in my knees and picking all of this dirt in the floor and the dog is looking at me. <laughs> and all this pride that I had for the last three days is just gone. <laughs> I was the guy who was cleaning the <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and only lasted three days. Um, and that's always connected to my, my, my trip to Sydney and, and in Australia. So I'm so glad to be here. The early days were tough. Um, uh, early days were very, very difficult. I had never done this before. Um, with a lot of doubts, this was a plant that was closed by Kraft after 75 years. Mm. And I had very little resources. I didn't exactly know what I was going to do. I knew I was going to make yoga, but I didn't know how and where and what, offering what. I had five factory workers that I hired from the previous mm -hmm. 55 and they let go. And, and I... I remember like yesterday, the, the August 15, 2005, I have the key and we're having the first board meeting with these five factory workers and myself. That they worked in craft plant for the last 15, 20 years mm -hmm. at a time. And our first board meeting, Mike, the maintenance guy said, so what are we gonna do now? I said, Mike, we're going to go to the hardware store. We're going to buy some white paints. We're going to buy some red paints and we're going to buy some blue paints. 
and then we're going to come and paint this wall. You saw it on the video, this says 1920. That wall was not white, it was white when they did it first time, but it was black. It was black. just not painted for the last 20 years. And so we're going to paint that and then everybody did everything else. So imagine these guys, they just lost their job and there's this guy who doesn't even know how to speak English is <laughs> in, in this upstate New York town, doesn't even have an idea what he's going to do or what we're going to do. They're trying to make a plan for their life going forward. Other 50 ones have left. They have the five of them is still there. And he's asking us to paint the wall. So, you know, he said, tell me you have more plans than that one. <laughs> and I said, I didn't. <laughs> but one thing that we did is we never sit down and wonder what we were going to do next. Mm -hmm. One of the best things I have done at that time is we, paint, we painted those walls all summer, five of us. That's what we did. And I don't remember what happened after, but I remember that because I refused to sit down and wonder and us to just walk around. We did something. So in the, in the, I realized it later on is that they say, when you start walking the way, the way appears. There's something magic about doing things while you're thinking. And that lets into energy, that lets into ideas, that lets into something that you do innovation or something else. And that was our first step. And that's what took us two years to build the plant in a way that I can make those products, um, bought some used equipments, came up with the name, mm -hmm. designed the cups together with those five people. I mean, those are the things that we've done. And then we launched it in 2007, October, in a kosher store in, in Long Island with six flavors, and I still have the picture. And this is our 10th year. And that was the first time that whatever we made was offered to someone to see it. And then it was history after, yeah. People often talk about the role of culture in the success of your organization. Although I think it's something of a, of a pun. If you, you have to talk about culture if you're talking about yogurt, surely. Sure. But um, <laughs> tell, me, tell me, though, what is special about Chobani's culture? And, and just on the point that you began with just five employees, but now yeah. 2,000 or more. How do, you, how do you maintain an organizational culture when you go through such rapid growth? Um, <clears throat> I, I say the companies are not, you know, companies are not run or governed or, or operated by written rules on the walls or in the papers. It's, it's, ruled, it's ruled or operated by culture that mm -hmm. lives within the walls, that it's in the air. Um, as an entrepreneur, we have opportunity because we're starting things from the scratch. So we have choices to make how we are going to set this tone. And it's always belonged to, you know, attached to the leadership that mm -hmm. it's in there. And then people around it, of course. I, uh, I had never ran companies did anything like that before. So I didn't re read business books or I didn't attend to business school. So I didn't know what was happening in the outside of, you know, in, in the business world before. But I just did it the way that I saw from my mom, my dad, or, you know, the life and whatever. But one thing that, what, what creates cultures uh, are stories. Um, and those stories are extremely, extremely popular, uh, powerful. Um, I was there, I was always there for the first five, six years. If I asked someone to do something, I was always there doing with it with them. I was a factory worker before I did anything. So how you interact with early five, how those five interact with somebody else, creates boundaries, creates rules, creates like unwritten mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, culture is not built only in the work hours from nine to five. Cultures are built in life. It built with seconds and minutes and hours and days and the months, and then it combines and creates this thing. We can call it culture, we can call it internal brand or brand. And, and it's not built with the videos like this. It's, it's just like living thing in every day. So it's, it's basically a discipline. But you can't do it unless you're real. Mm. So if it's a real, then it's not a work because you're just behaving who you are every day. And I'm not saying 
the realness should be this way or this way or this way. But pretending is extremely uh, difficult and it creates a lot of waste. So I had to start with myself. I'm a guy from Turkey who's Kurd, who speaks a broken English, who is foreign in the country and does not know a lot of things. And I have choices to make to pretend that I know all of those things. I'm the smart guy, or I'm this guy, I'm that guy. Or I say, I don't know. So I created this thing is not knowing is OK. And it's, it's accepted, and it's fine. But what we're going to do is what we're going to learn after that. Yeah. So what I made sure the first day is everybody can come to Chobani as who they are where they come from, what they are, what kind of background they have, did not matter because mm -hmm. I was that guy too. So can somebody come to work as who they are from home at real, and then go back to home who they are without pretending? And can we create an environment that there is not a criticism or danger of criticism exists? So imagine if you remove that, you're saving 50% of the time people's life. Really, because we go to meetings, we go to the uh, interactions and all that stuff, we pretend to be something else. We mm -hmm. pretend to be smarter, we pretend to be better looking, we pretend to have a better, all of that is out. I don't know is okay, and everybody's accepted as who they are, and the productivity goes out of control. And then, what happens is, it becomes this comfortable place where everybody can exist as who they are. And it becomes very, very magical. But it just takes the activity of doing this every day, every second, every minute. It has to be real. That's why, that's why I, um, I say it. And then act of it, that what you do. Like, you know, I'm very worried about what's happening in Texas and Harvey. And I look at company's reaction, Chobani's reaction, what happened. Our employees in our plant, online, in line right now, signing the yogurt uh, cases, filling trucks, and some volunteers are prepared to go to Houston right now, in Louisiana, mm -hmm. in that area, to be with the people who are being hurt right now. Mm. Now, this is not something that decision came from the top or something mm. like that. This lives in the culture. This is an immediate um, reflex of what you're buying. Okay, this is something is happening, people are getting hurt, this is why I exist, and we gotta go in there. And, and that doesn't, doesn't happen immediately. It just takes time to be able to, uh, and once you have it, um, it, it is extremely powerful. I mean, that's what Peter did in here in Australia. He built the culture. In five years, what he built here is unthinkable. Like, I wasn't here, he did it by himself, but he built on top of that culture that we had in, in New York. And, and now he's number two brand, he's just launched Flip, he's, he's probably gonna be number one brand you know, very, very soon. And if you look back in 2012, and I only, I left five years ago, I've never been back, this Chobani is no different than what Chobani we have in the US. Yeah. It's exactly the same. In an Australian way, it's a localized way. But what, what it does is just makes it so powerful that nothing is not possible anymore. You can do anything. Tell me about the link between this unique culture and the innovation, which seems to be at the heart of Chobani's growth. We were very humble this year. Fast Company picked us to be uh, one of the world's 50, right, Michael? 50 most innovative companies. And we were, I think, between Starbucks and us, we were the two companies that they mentioned in the food world. And what we do is simple, pure yogurt right now, mm. right? Why is that it's so innovative? Um, so we have to look at the innovation in a perspective of that it can be completely disruptive as going product to another place, like mm -hmm. in technology we see, or it can be something that you go extremely back to what it was before and bringing that to up. Innovation is also doing something that status quo is doing this way. You don't have to follow what those big guys are doing. I do it this way. Yeah. And if innovation only comes with the permission that everybody has a permission to play with things. 
And the per permission really comes from the leaders. And, and you say, am I going to just be a follower of when the decision is made and up there, I'm just going to do that. But all I, am I going to be always bothered by something or I will always look for some other opportunities? And somebody came to me the other day. I said, hey, I did this at Chobani Brand. I'm doing this. I'm changing the name of Flip, and I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And is that OK? I said, who gives a shit? You can change anything you want. As long as, as, long as the reason why we exist doesn't change, as long as what we do every day doesn't change, as long as the, the fundamentals doesn't change, you can play with anything. But that playing mindset is creates, creates speed and creates innovation. Mm -hmm. And I love being fast. I hate wasting time. I, I hate that you can come up with an idea and you're all set to go, and then it takes you two years to, 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 mm. to launch it. That, that I don't get it. So I built a plant in Idaho, for example. It's a million square feet. That plant that you saw on the picture, a big one. Million square feet. I spent $500 million. And from the breaking ground to the product coming out, was less than one year. So that's, this is unheard of, never happens. And then it took us two years more to operate it, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, we will learn that too now. <laughs> but I just hate wasting times, and, and, and it's OK to make mistakes, and, and hopefully you will make good decisions along the way, and you learn from it. One of the things I really applaud about the company is the determination from the very start to give back to the local community. Yeah. Tell me about that, the rationale, and it's, what advice would you have for other companies? Yeah, it, it's, it's in the DNA. The first thing I've done is, you mentioned, I printed in the cup. I said, 10% of profit that we make is going to go back to the world. It was, of course, it was easy to write that because I had sold nothing then. And <laughs> it was easy to give back. And then... Uh, and then it became, it became so powerful. And the first thing that we did was we, we were in this tiny little town. It's called Norwich. It's a New Berlin, South Amherst, New Berlin. And my assistant came, secretary, they came and said, there's this little league field in town. And they're looking for a donation for $20,000 to make the field better. So where we are is, I don't know if you know upstate New York, Cooperstown is, you know, is not too far from us. And Cooperstown has one of the best baseball fields. It's the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah. And I lived there for a reason, not for baseball, but it was closer to my other cheese company. And I saw this field and I said, hmm, I wonder if we can build something better than just cleaning the field. So I said to Cassie, I said, can we build a field in this tiny little village, a baseball field that's better than the one in Cooperstown, because they have a lot of money. They make a lot of things. <laughs> and we did. We, um, of course, it's not 20,000 anymore. It was 100 times more, 10 times uh, a lot more. And she built, with the local contractors, uh, a little league field with the lights on, scoreboards, grass. Beautiful, beautiful field. I mean, I knew nothing about baseball. <laughs> but in the first day, it was July 4th, and we, we had the opening of the field. And these kids were lined up, and I had the baseball jersey on, and I threw the first ball. It was my first time ever I threw it. I'm a soccer guy. I love soccer, but football. <laughs> and these kids were lined up, were asking me to do something. And I realized that they were asking me to sign their jerseys. Now, before that moment, nobody asked me to sign anything before. But yet, these kids were, were asking me. And it was a magical moment for me and for company. It was only, we were only two years in. It was the first time we made money to spend on this 10% thing. Mm -hmm. And it became this addiction. And then from that moment on, I built community teams and in Norwich, and then I built it in Idaho, and now we have it here in Australia. And I said, before we go anywhere into the world, we have to be here first. We have to be in our community first. We have to take care of our kids here. Uh, the need is here. We gotta, we gotta elevate our community first. Then we have a permission to go other places. And that's what we've been doing. Um, 
Now, I will speak my mind. A lot of companies have uh, CRM company, what is it? Um, whatever, so social responsibility thing. Corporate that they, social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility, I hate that word. So, <laughs> It's, it's a good combination of the words. So responsibility is good, you know, social is good, but what it stands for is being used in a wrong way in so many different places. It's just a check the box. That when you talk about it, you can tell people, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Now that's, that's a poison, that's a trap. We need to bring this into DNA of one of the reasons of existing of our company and our products. This is one of the reasons I do what I do every single day. Right. The practice of business itself, if it's done right, is one of the most effective change maker in today's society. More than governments, more than NGOs, more than any movement. Businesses are the most effective change makers if they are done right. Okay. Now, imagine you, you put that mindset of how you purchase, how you operate in your places, how you make your product that brings to the people's life, and then what you do with it when you come back. And then imagine that that was believed by everyone who works in that company, by the customer, by the supplier, and imagine that everyone who comes to work every single day knows that when I go to work today, the way that I make something, it will have a positive impact not only the practice of the business, but what we do after. Then it's not work anymore. It's still a business yeah. because I love the field of business. Business is, needs to stay business. We have to compete, we have to innovate, we have to crash the competitors and all that stuff, we do it. But instead of having a check the box, but it lives within DNA, it's not a given back, it's the reason of existing in my opinion. Someone was going to tell me when our time was up, which I can't see, but I suspect our meal's going cold. Can I ask you just one more question? I would like to ask you many more. Because in terms of giving back, you've also given to your employees a yeah. really remarkable initiative with the, the decision to give 10% of Chobani to employees. But can I ask you a local question? Tell me more about the decision to, to come to Australia, to, to work with the facilities in Dandenong, What's behind that? What's the strategy that you've got for Chobani in this part of the world? Um, I wanted to see if Chobani is possible in another part of the world. Um, I wonder if this was a local thing or if this could be repeated somewhere else. I really did want, wonder about that. An easy way to do that, and I was looking for a, either Turkish-speaking or English-speaking country. So I wasn't going to go back to Turkey, so that's gone. <laughs> um, so I looked, I looked at Canada, I looked at UK, and I looked at Australia. And Canada is close to UK, so UK, so US, so it's not a, it's, it's not a different market really. And Europe is difficult market. I knew that, so it just left Australia. The question was, I had never been to Australia before. So, so that wonder of. Can this be repeated again? The second thing I wondered is, you know, Australia stays in a very unique position globally. You know, it's, you have US, a smaller version of US here in other part of the world, which is a gate to the another world here mm -hmm. in the Asia, which is safe, food safety, food yeah. security, banking system, infrastructure, protection of the IP, and all that kind of stuff exists. And, and I could use the materials that I developed in, in US in here, which is, will be easier. Uh, so it was no brainer. Uh, and that's the reason I picked it in here. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join with me in thanking Hamdi for his words?